Good evening, I'm Adrian Arsenault. Tonight, a CBC News exclusive, Canada's top doctor on the toll of COVID-19. Every number that I utter is someone's family member. Canada is flattening the curve, but can the country reopen? How long should people be expected to feel this far apart? Dr. Teresa Tam, one-on-one -on -one with Rosie on what our new normal will look like. I'm Andrew Chang. Also tonight, how the virus affects kids. They're very itchy, almost like bug bites. And the surprising new symptom pediatricians are telling parents to watch for. Fires, layoffs, now this. More than 10,000 flee floodwaters in Fort McMurray. And Parliament goes virtual with mixed results. Is Haidu? Please unclick your mute. Oh, got it. Sorry. We've all been there. This is The National. The tide is turning against COVID-19. Top officials gave some encouraging details today that show the payoff from your extraordinary sacrifices. That's led to more talk about the next phase of this ordeal, how to go about carefully reducing physical distancing measures when it's warranted and where. We are observing slowed epidemic growth and a leveling off of epidemic trajectories across most jurisdictions in Canada. Canada's chief public health officer made it clear today at a public briefing, provinces and territories won't all move at once to start lifting restrictions. It will depend on local conditions. But she said a lot more than that to our chief political correspondent, Rosemary Barton. Tonight, in the second part of a CBC News exclusive interview, Dr. Teresa Tam gives us a clearer picture of the next new normal. So how do we get from this to a new normal? Reopening businesses, public spaces, the country. Dr. Teresa Tam paints a stark picture of what Canada could look like. A reinvention of how we work and interact. Come up with a plan of how your workplace could potentially be um, redesigned, have your shift a bit differently. Your workflow might be different. You stagger people coming in so that you're not just your work shifts, but maybe your public transport means that you're not all crowded at the same rush hour. But it's a delicate balance. Health officials are aware of the dangerous consequences of a prolonged shutdown. Mental health problems, increased alcohol abuse, increased domestic violence or minors in vulnerable situations. Tam knows physical distancing is hard and can't go on forever. But I do think that this sort of juncture is a particularly difficult one where people have contributed so much already. It's a bit like running the marathon and sort of hitting a bit that wall and you go, there's still another 10 kilometers before we're kind of here. Uh, it, is, it is tough. The cost of going fast with reopening the economy though is too great. A second surge of the pandemic before there's a vaccine or a treatment. I just have the image of New York City in my head and think I would never want that to happen anywhere in Canada. And if we let um, things resume too fast, we may get that kind of surge. The first phase of COVID-19 isn't even over, and already Tam is planning for the next one. In the next winter um, season, when um, it's not just living with uh, COVID-19, you're gonna get influenza, and so, being able to uh, prepare for that is part of the new normal. A new normal that is being decided and planned right now, but will likely have to change again as Canadians learn to live with COVID-19 until a vaccine is found. Rosemary Barton, CBC News, Ottawa. And we'll have more from that exclusive interview coming up. Rosie asks Dr. Tam about criticism of how the World Health Organization responded to COVID-19 and whether it's been tough enough on China. So let's turn now to the new federal projections that show Canada is having success fighting this virus. Salima Shibji has the latest snapshot on COVID-19 in Canada and how that picture is set to change. A glimmer of hope mixed with caution. In many parts of the country, the curve has flattened, but we're not out of the woods yet. We're in the middle of the most serious public health emergency Canada has ever seen. But there is good news in the data. 
Across the country, the spread of the virus is slowing down. One infected person now infects only one other Canadian. The number of cases doubling every 16 days now, not every three like just a few weeks ago, because of strict physical distancing. It is really slowing down. But those positive signs are up against the sobering reality. A heavy death toll concentrated among the most vulnerable. 79% of COVID-19 deaths clustered in long-term care and seniors' homes. And outbreaks are raging in other places, too, where distancing is an issue. Meatpacking plants, prisons and homeless shelters. That means even as the confirmed cases start to slow, more people have died than expected. From 2.2% on April the 9th to 5.5 percent as of April the 27th. We are seeing the tragic paradox of the epidemic playing out. That paradox most acute in Canada's largest provinces, Quebec and Ontario. Federal officials now project deaths from COVID-19 could reach nearly 3,900 by this time next week, about 1,100 more than right now, even as provinces outline the path forward to ease some restrictions. What we really happy to see is that every jurisdiction uh, have said that we really need to move cautiously. Cautious and gradual. That's what all the provinces have agreed to in a set of new federal guidelines, making sure testing and healthcare capacity are up to par as they all try to navigate the delicate balance of reopening their economies without prompting a resurgence of cases. Salima Shivji, CBC News, Ottawa. Well, today, Quebec announced businesses there will soon be reopening, despite being the hardest hit province. More than half of Canada's now 50,000 cases are in Quebec. It's there, too, that you'll find the highest death toll. More than 1,600 lives claimed by this virus. Alison Northcott with how the reopening will unfold and the possible risks. This flower shop has been closed to in-person customers for more than a month. Reopening it will require big changes. We're just going to have to get, a, you know, figure out a plan like they did at the grocery stores and, you know, with arrows on the floors and, and put markings on the floors of where people can stand. Maybe we're going to have to set up a barrier also at the cash. Uh, it's, uh, it's all new for us. The Quebec government says over the month of May, street front retail stores, construction and manufacturing can get back to business. Our challenge is to gradually restart the economy without restarting the pandemic. The Premier says aside from major outbreaks in long-term care homes, COVID-19 is under control in Quebec and it's time to slowly start reopening. Montreal has been shut down to, to a large extent other than essential services. and That's one of the reasons we want to progressively reopen. Business groups say it's a good first step to help struggling companies, but experts say it does come with risk. It's clear that when you, you do any, any opening at all, in terms of going back, trying to get back towards normal, that we're going to see more cases of infection and, and possibly an increasing demand on the healthcare system. So it's, it's inevitable that will happen. The key, he says, is to monitor closely, do lots of testing and scale back if things get bad. We have five locations that are closed and basically no income. Genevieve Heistek says she won't reopen her stores unless she knows it's safe for customers and staff. It's hard for her to imagine what that will look like. Our stores have traditionally been like very bustling, very packed, very full stores. So trying to reimagine that in a world where you can only let two or three people into a store, that's going to take some work. Other businesses like hair salons and restaurants will have to wait. And the province says even those that are reopening could close again if there's a major spike in cases. Alison Northcott, CBC News, Montreal. PEI announced today its restart will begin May the 1st. In phase one, non-urgent health care providers can be back in business and non-contact outdoor activities like golfing and fishing can resume. Retail stores won't reopen until phase two. That is scheduled for May 22nd. And Manitoba is planning to reveal its reopening strategy tomorrow. Ahead of that, the premier announced today that testing criteria is being expanded. It will now include anyone with the common symptoms of COVID-19 even if those symptoms are mild. As businesses prepare to reopen their doors, though, some employers are having a hard time getting staff to return. As the CBC's Karen McIntosh tells us, they say the federal benefit for workers might just be too generous. Tony Sawicki's Winnipeg restaurant is only doing delivery. 
He's down from 30 employees to eight. We don't really know how many employees we can hire back. As he contemplates reopening, he's finding some don't want to come back. If we open in two, magically in two weeks, how do we make coming to work with the uncertainty of any kind of business more attractive than them sitting at home collecting 500 bucks a week? The Canada Emergency Response Benefit provides up to $500 a week for up to 16 weeks, intended for people that lose their income but not necessarily their job or need to stay home, say, to take care of a child. But now, across the retail and hospitality industries, employers say they're having a hard time competing with it. We've actually even had uh, uh, feedback from em employees telling us that their accountants are even saying that it's more beneficial for them to stay at home. So how much did that cost? There are even worries it could slow the reopening of the economy. I want to appeal to individuals across the province that this is a short-term fix. The Prime Minister says he expects businesses and employees to act in good faith. Ideally, people will keep their connections with their workplaces so that uh, they can know that they have a job to return to when this is over. At the end of the day, Canada has to get back to work. Ultimately, this labour lawyer says employers hold the hammer. If a workplace is safe, refusal to work is cause for dismissal and loss of all benefits. So effectively, the employee would be fired? Yes, the employee would be fired for not returning to the workplace. A lot of employers aren't doing that. It's pretty hard-headed. Something Sawicki says he doesn't want to do. Help keep your businesses alive and come back to work. Anyone who leaves their job voluntarily would also be ineligible. Of course, the big unknown for anyone opting not to work right now would be what the job market might look like when their benefits expire. Cameron McIntosh, CBC News, Winnipeg. Now, COVID-19 is not hitting children as hard as adults, and it can present differently too. Canadian pediatricians are now warning about one particularly unusual symptom. Health reporter Christine Birak has more on that and what else we know about the threat to kids. Most people don't like showing off their feet, but Sadie Dohan knew something was off. They were very itchy, almost like bug bites. Doctors in the U.S. and Canada were recently sent an alert. Look out for cases of kids with purple, swollen toes. Sometimes they're hot and painful. Sometimes the children are otherwise well. The condition has been dubbed COVID toes, and doctors are being told to test patients for the virus. The skin findings themselves are a self-resolving phenomenon and shouldn't be a cause for concern. But it is important that physicians be aware that this condition may be a sign of COVID-19. Children pick up plenty of germs. The coronavirus is no exception. But in some ways, this virus is different. COVID is acting differently than most other typical illnesses, such as influenza. It hasn't been really making children very sick. Chinese researchers found about 6% of children infected with COVID-19 became severely or critically ill. In adults, it's nearly 20%. Doctors aren't sure why, but many suspect children might have a different immune response. With this virus being novel, the novel coronavirus, we're learning new things every single day. In an effort to get ahead of this disease, pediatricians are sharing information globally, including reports of a rare but severe inflammatory disease that's apparently being seen in some children in Europe. But Canadian doctors say those reports are not confirmed. We don't know how many cases there are. We don't know if it's really an increase from what you would expect. And we certainly don't know if it's linked to COVID. In serious cases of COVID-19, doctors say children do have the same symptoms as adults. If a child has high fever, coughing and trouble breathing, they should be rushed to emergency. Christine Birak, CBC News, Toronto. Okay, so we have Dr. Dina Kulik joining us just to chat a little bit more about this. And, and Dr. Kulik, how compelling is the evidence of a link between COVID-19 and, and COVID toes? There's certainly a link. We are seeing more and more cases being reported around the world. Some people have confirmed COVID infection. Other people are still waiting for their test results. But around the world, we're seeing some kids with this rash and COVID infection. But, and so given then that, what would you advise to parents who, if they see COVID toes or something similar and say no other symptoms, what ought they to do? So in this case, because of this different kind of rash, we are actually recommending that these kids get tested for COVID. 
many other symptoms like coughing or runny nose or fever or vomiting, most of us are saying stay home, stay away from people that are at higher risk of severe COVID infection, like the elderly and people with chronic health concerns. But because we're monitoring this rash so carefully, we're actually suggesting to families that if your child has this rash, even if otherwise they're asymptomatic and well, they should actually be tested for COVID. Okay, Dr. Kulik, thanks for your time. You're welcome. And tonight, Toronto's Sick Kids Hospital has declared a COVID-19 outbreak. Over the weekend, a teenage patient tested positive for the virus. Since then, his parents and a healthcare worker returned positive test results as well, along with another patient who isn't connected to the first case. The hospital says it is investigating how the virus was transmitted. Meanwhile, Post Media says it is closing 15 community papers across Manitoba and in parts of southern Ontario. 80 people will be laid off. The company says it has been hit hard by the economic impacts of the pandemic, with its advertising revenue significantly suffering. Post Media says it will look into providing some online coverage for affected communities. In other news, severe flooding in Fort McMurray, Alberta, is getting worse, with over 12,000 people forced from their homes. And as Rafi Bujikanian explains, it's hurting people who are all too familiar with hardship. For long-time Fort McMurray residents, the emergency food pickups are all too familiar. We went through the wildfire and everything else, so everybody in town is pretty much used to the bottled water. In fact, this is the third evacuation for the laid laws. After the fire and a previous flood, they admit it's hard to keep it all straight. Almost like the whole town forgot there was uh, even a pandemic on the go. Even just the difference in, you know, before in the grocery stores, people almost held their breath before you walked by. And now people are over, or not over engaged, but engaged to make sure that, you know, you're okay. The ice jams that caused all this shrank a little overnight, but the blockage is still more than twice the size of a football field. This former MLA's house was destroyed in the 2016 fire, the one he was building to replace it, now severely damaged. I'm a bit troubled by what's going on, but, uh, you know, we're going to survive, we're going to get through this. Still, Gene says he's been through worse. In 2015, he lost his son to illness. And after that, it's pretty uh, easy to take the rest. I don't want to lose this stuff, but it is just stuff. You can replace it. As for the municipality, local officials initially wanted the army to step in. They're now stepping back from that after the province said this. There is no reasonable engineering solution to unlock the ice jams at this point. We have to rely on warm weather to soften the ice. And while Ottawa says it's standing by to help if asked, the Alberta government says it's got things under control and hopes the coming warm and sunny weather will keep melting the ice jam. Rafi Bujikani and CBC News, Edmonton. A drunk driver who killed three children and their grandfather in 2015 has been granted day parole. Marco Muzzo pleaded guilty to impaired driving, causing death after a devastating collision north of Toronto. He was sentenced to 10 years in prison, but has served less than half of that. The children's mother shared news of the parole board's decision on social media, saying no matter what happened today, both her kids and dad won't be coming home. There are some new details now from Nova Scotia's RCMP on their investigation into the rampage that left 22 victims dead. Kayla Hounsell explains how the gunman managed to evade police for so long. It's dark and grainy, but police say this photo shows the gunman, Gabriel Wortman, arriving at an industrial area late Saturday evening. This is the area where police believe he spent the night, 26 kilometers away from where the rampage started and where the police spent all night searching for him. They now believe he left that first scene through a field just nine minutes after they arrived. We don't know exactly what he did uh, while he was there. Uh, we don't know exactly where he secreted himself or that police car or that replica police car. As for that car, police now say he obtained it in the fall of 2019. It shows to me that this was very premeditated. I mean, obviously, with having several different vehicles with light bars and acquiring uniforms and that type of thing, that takes a, a lot of thought. 
By Sunday morning, he's moved along another 44 kilometers. That's where he kills corrections officers Sean McLeod and Alana Jenkins. We believe that um, the government took the lives of those individuals uh, shortly after arriving. Um, however, we believe that the gunman uh, more than likely had stayed in that residence for a period of time before setting on fire. He's seen leaving that area almost three hours after he arrived. He's captured several more times on various surveillance videos. Outside Truro, he pulls over and changes his clothes. Shortly after that, he kills Constable Heidi Stevenson, then goes to the home of his last victim, leaves some of his police uniform outside, kills her and steals her car before heading off to gas it up, where he's shot and killed by police. Though the gunman will never stand trial, we will still have a duty to complete this investigation by the same standards that we would have if he was standing trial. Police say right now their priorities are to determine how the gunman obtained his authentic RCMP uniform, what he did before his shooting rampage, and whether anyone helped him. Kayla Hounsel, CBC News. Halifax. Well, just ahead on The National, our chief political correspondent and Canada's top doctor. In her first interview since the pandemic started, Dr. Theresa Tam on guiding the country through these historic times, enduring racist attacks online, and the emotional toll of delivering bad news to the country. Every number that I utter is someone's family member. Plus, a historic day for Canada's parliament, just not in Canada's parliament. Is Haidu? Please unclick your mute. Oh, got it. Sorry. Next, the highs and lows of the first virtual sitting of the House of Commons. We're back in two. Raising these issues that will, in particular, affect seniors. I'm sorry, something is ringing. Well, like other Canadians now working from home, politicians discovered a simple truth today. When it comes to getting technology to cooperate when you need it to, the struggle is real. Three months into COVID-19 and politics, like life, goes on as members of Parliament figure out how to work remotely. David Cochran shows us how that's going. Do not adjust your set. The Honourable Minister of Health. But please, unmute your mic. The Honourable Minister of Health is Haidu. Please unclick your mute. Oh, got it. Sorry. Welcome to Question Period during a pandemic. Minister. Featuring some photo bombs. Oh, pandemic. Some whiteouts. Wherever this was, and some bad internet. Hey, and I'll, I'll, I'll speak louder. So it's basically your weekly family Zoom chat, only with the Speaker of the House of Commons running a committee of nearly 300 MPs from a command centre in Ottawa. Unable to come to this house, they log on from their house or their office and try, try to do business as usual. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? You're on. There were the normal exchanges done in abnormal ways. Can the Prime Minister explain why Health Canada has yet, as has to this point, been unable to implement a fast track process so that provinces can get the new testing kits that they so desperately need? We have approved a number of different tests. We will be approving more, but it needs to be done in a safe way. And on Wednesday, it will look more like normal as a small group will gather in person in the House to vote on legislation. Mr. Speaker, we can't hear him if you're listening to English. But Tuesdays and eventually Thursdays will be like this. Uh, I've switched my uh, language to English. I was on, on floor, but perhaps uh, if I speak uh, in English, uh, people can hear me. Uh, uh, Ms. Vecchio, can you hear me now? She, she can. I saw her give the thumbs up. I'll let you continue. A work in progress in the age of coronavirus. Hey, we're, we're all learning together here. Nobody said democracy was easy. David Cochran, CBC News, Ottawa. Next on The National, a personal in-depth interview with Canada's top doctor. Dr. Theresa Tam opens up about her high-stress, high-stakes job and the personal toll of guiding the government through a historic public health challenge. Racist, uh, some of it misogynist. Um, and I would like to know how you experience that, or do you? Part two of Rosemary's exclusive interview right after this.
She is Canada's top doctor, the face of pandemic policy and planning. Nearly every day, her briefings lay out the reality of COVID-19 in Canada. But Dr. Teresa Tam has also become a target, facing open challenges to the way she's done her job and Canada's reliance on the World Health Organization for direction. That's where Chief Political Correspondent Rosemary Barton begins in this exclusive interview. There is mounting global pressure on the World Health Organization to answer to critics who say it was too slow in its response to the coronavirus from when it was first detected and too trusting of the data it got from China where the outbreak started. Severely mismanaging and covering up the spread. Its credibility questioned. We've got uh, serious concerns about the accuracy of the information coming out. Even its role challenged, but the organization which compiles and shares data from 190 member states around the world is also seen as valuable. Canada will always be there to support uh, science and the work done internationally. Including by Dr. Teresa Tam, Canada's top doctor, who sits on the committee that oversees the WHO Health Emergencies Program and uses much of that scientific evidence to chart the way forward for Canada. There are uh, questions being raised about the way the WHO has handled this, the way they've dealt with China, the fact that they um, took the information from China at face value. Do you think that those are fair criticisms? Um, I think it's a, it's a very difficult job to do, quite honestly. I think the data is what it is. You're going to have to work with information at the time that you've received and it may be incomplete. No, but should they have su assumed that um, because they were dealing with a country that isn't transparent, that the information they were getting wasn't accurate, that the problem was probably worse than China was letting on? Um, I think we have to remain open to different scenarios. Um, the international community of the top experts in this area of work um, also, maybe if, um, because of the evolution of the knowledge, may have all underestimated where this could have gone. The estimations of how transmissible the virus was um, and how severe it was, was unclear at the start. The loss of containment, really, mm -hmm. uh, with the spread to other countries outside of Asia and outside of China, I think was something that uh, people underestimated globally. Do you not think that the WHO, and I know you play a role in the WHO, that, that we would need some sort of post-mortem um, in terms of how they, how they did things early on? I think it's always worthwhile uh, to examine what went on, especially after such an extraordinary and sure. unprecedented event. We would always want that and look at what could be done better. Like all warnings, maybe not every country took it as seriously as they could. But in Canada, we stood up our response really, really early and started getting the country prepared. But absolutely, I think, you know, a re-examination of what went well, what didn't go well. Um, in the end, though, I think the spirit of the IHR is that every country has to share information. So it's not just up to the WHO, it's all member states actually have to do what we said we were going to do. Right. And so, um, so there'll be um, lessons learned from both sides. You have uh, been attacked by the Alberta Premier, Jason Kenney. This is the same Dr. Tam who in January was repeating uh, talking points um, out of the PRC about the no evidence of human-to-human -human transmission. The Conservative leadership candidate Derek Sloan's asked the question, does she work for Canada or for China? How do you feel when you hear those kinds of comments? Um, well, I mean, first of all, I know that that is false information. Uh, but, you know, as I've said, I'm really busy focusing on the actual response and that is what I'm here to do. And, and I don't do this alone. It is a collective response. So, um, so that is a really important point. I mean, uh, this started early on in the kinds of uh, attacks you get on social media. Um, much of it racist, uh, some of it misogynist. Um, I would like to know how you experience that, or do you? 
Yes, and I think maybe I just sort of compartmentalize it. I don't know. I think everybody copes with these things a little bit differently. One of the things I worry most is stigmatization mm -hmm. of certain populations. And I spoke out on that, um, knowing how we treat people um, in different ways affects people's health. And that's how I sort of look at it. Mm -hmm. And stigmatization is, leads to poor health outcomes. And it does not help uh, our collective response. So I think the only way to get through this is do it together. And one of my roles as the Chief Public Health Officer is to speak to Canadians and bring them along. That's what I worry about more than any individual attack on me personally, is that I am the credible voice. And in order to maintain that credibility, in order to uh, provide the kind of messaging that would bring Canadians along so that they know what the advice is. So I think that um, is what I'm trying to preserve. There are now 49,025 confirmed cases including 2,766 deaths. When you give your briefing each morning, you start always the same way, uh, the number of cases, the number of deaths. Those are people that we're talking about. And I wonder Absolutely. what that's like for you to have to say that every day. It is actually very difficult. And I think behind the sort of calm sort of reporting to give people the actual facts is you know, in our brains and I think in our hearts is that we're moving along with the emotions of the population. We feel extremely impacted when we hear about and look at the long-term care home outbreaks and knowing that every number that I utter is someone's family member. Um, in the way that I've always worked is I imagine that the person or the Canadian sitting in the middle of everything that I do. I think that what is difficult is that this pandemic has, of course, shone a light on the health inequities. Yeah. But it is a societal challenge. It's not a single person. It is um, how we uh, value and support our elders and our seniors. And I think all of us needs to re-examine um, what we need to do going forwards. You, you talked about your, your cautious optimism. Can you right now give people a sense of how long they have to dig in this way? How long should people be expected to feel this far apart, so far apart from people? So I think the reason why we have some optimism is that we are seeing this epidemic slowing down. But until you have actual immunity in the population, we know that people's lifestyles will have to be adjusted. I think public health is asking, well, here that some of the parameters. Come up with a plan of how your workplace could potentially be um, redesigned, have your shift a bit differently. Mm -hmm. You stagger people coming in so that you're not just your work shifts, but maybe your public transport means that you're not all crowded at the same rush hour. Right, right. Those are the kind of ideas that will allow, I think, um, some of those measures to be uh, eased off a bit. But I think my concern right now is that the cost of reignition of the epidemic is, is, is huge. I just have the image of New York City in my head and I think I would never want that to happen anywhere in Canada. And if we let um, things resume too fast, we may get that kind of surge. I think we need to plan in any case for all of that surge to still be in place. I'm still planning ahead to well, what happens in the next winter um, season when um, it's not just living with uh, COVID-19, you're gonna get influenza, you're going to get the other viruses. And so being able to uh, prepare for that is part of the new normal as well. Hmm. How hard is that to know that people are sort of getting to the end of what they can handle emotionally and mentally? All of us feel a little bit fraught at this point, yes. I think, right? Yes. Yeah, so I do think that 
this sort of juncture is a particularly difficult one where mm -hmm. people have contributed so much already and you're trying to say it's a bit like running the marathon and sort of hitting a bit that wall and you go there's still another 10 kilometers <laughs> before we're kind of here uh, it is it is tough I think looking at blocks of time is important so you can't look too far ahead let's look at the next two weeks mm -hmm. last two weeks I'm thinking okay there are signs that this this curve is bending you're now seeing some jurisdictions being able to get to that next phase soon and so I think we are seeing those little steps and little bits of progress I think is what gets people going I, I don't, are you a worrier? I don't know if you're a worrier. You said the other day you're working about 20 hours a day. Do you, do you lie in bed and, and get stressed out? What do you do to help yourself? I know um, you don't like talking about yourself, but... <laughs> <laughs> yes, it's interesting. Yeah, I'm a fairly private person and yeah. a bit of an introvert, but um, it's true, I do feel a bit tired. Uh, but I am fully cognizant of the fact that when I advise our team to make sure you, know, you keep your mental health up and and your physical health as well, that I might not be the best example and that I need to do better on that mm -hmm. front. Thank you very much for all this time. I appreciate Thank it you. very much. And I would shake your hand, but I'm not allowed to. That's right. <laughs> You'd That's be right. very mad at me. Yes. <laughs> so Rosie, you, you got a lot of information from Dr. Tam and, and you pressed her on some of her advice to government. What's your big takeaway? Well, first of all, I think just the speed at which all of this has unfolded, the pandemic and, and the many, many unknowns and the way in which the public health agency and Dr. Tam have had to adapt and evolve their advice over time, leading to some really unprecedented government decisions, stopping cruise ships, shutting down international travel, shutting down the Canada-U.S. border. Much of this was pretty much unimaginable just six weeks ago. And when you ultimately think back to the interview, was there something that you were hoping to get out of it? You know, the chief public health officer is really there to offer her best scientific advice. It is the government who makes the decision. So this was about getting Dr. Tam to explain some of the thinking behind that advice. But ultimately, it's the government's behavior that must be examined, must be held to account, which is happening now and which will happen more going forward as we learn more. All right. Well, very insightful interview. Rosie, thanks so much. Thanks, Andrew. Still ahead on The National, does it seem like everyone is baking bread these days? From Jimmy Kimmel to Khloe Kardashian, maybe even someone you know is spending their quarantine needing. So we went to find out why baking is the hobby of self-isolation. The number of confirmed global COVID-19 cases now tops 3 million. The United States has more than a million cases all by itself. Spain and Italy have the next highest totals, more than 200,000 each. On paper, Russia is doing better than that. It has nearly 100,000 confirmed cases, but many doctors and experts believe the real number is a lot higher. As Chris Brown shows us, hospitals are being hit hard, and so are Russian workers. The bells from the Kremlin clock echo through a strikingly empty Moscow these days. With holidays approaching, President Vladimir Putin appeared with regional governors today, urging Russians not to gather together. We can't rest. The situation remains very difficult, he said. State TV is showing scenes of a stretched health care system barely keeping up. Though the capital is in better shape than many other places, doctors are among the casualties everywhere. Some have circulated a list of more than 70 who've already died. And then there are two who mysteriously fell out of hospital windows after being blamed for outbreaks at their facilities. Putin is also under pressure over the damage COVID has done to the economy. I don't think there's anything more terrifying than dying of hunger, said this unemployed migrant worker who's now living on handouts. Impoverished families have received very little money from the Kremlin, even though it has a big rainy day fund in reserve. There have been protests in the streets and online, pushing the government to spend it now. But opposition politician Dmitry Gudkov says Putin wants to spend the billions later on legacy projects. He wants to spend his money within maybe tens of years while he's in, in, the, in the power. Instead, the government says it expects firms like Anastasia Tatilova's catering company to pay workers, whether there's business or not. 
She's been forced to lay off 1,800 people. Предприниматели заслуживают того, чтобы в сложное время. Business pays their taxes, and now in these difficult times, we should get something in return, she said. Какие-то из этих денег за прошлый год. Instead, the Kremlin says it wants to fast-track efforts to get people working again, and it wants a plan in place by May 5th to do that. Chris Brown, CBC News, Vancouver. Well, next on The National, you head to the grocery store for some bacon supplies, but the shelves are empty. No question, baking is seeing a boom these days. And if you're among those putting the oven into overdrive, you will want to stick around. Well, these days, seems flour is becoming the new toilet paper. But get this, one of the most popular brands in Canada says it has plenty of product. It's just running out of those signature yellow bags to sell it in. So Robinhood says it'll start packaging flour in nondescript brown and white bags instead. Demand for flour and other products like yeast speaks to a pandemic renaissance of sorts in home baking. Greg Rasmussen has that story. I'm right now milling this to our sifted red spring flour. Milling grain used to be a sideline at this bakery and cafe. So this is our finished product. This has become white gold in a nation where flour and yeast are in short supply. So we started with whole grains before we started milling. And the coffee shop part of this business has been shuttered. Its fresh flour has become an economic savior selling out every day. And I think just with the increase of people baking at home, they're seeking out some comfort, and that's coming in the form of bread and cookies and biscuits. And so that has added additional pressure into the flour sales for sure. Thank you so much. No worries, have a good day. Many are posting their home-baked efforts online, a respite from all the bleak news. The world feels like it's ending. You go outside and there's like very few people are like lines and everyone's spaced apart. Or Isolated in his home, Brandon Lee says churning out cookies and cinnamon buns. So yeah, I'm just mixing through all the wet and dry ingredients. Together. Helps pass the time. Every time I put something in the oven it lasts like two weeks. I'm not sure if it's gonna work out. And when it does, I'm very surprised. I'm surprised again. Just delicious. One of the judges of the great Canadian baking show who has struggled with severe anxiety says making bread is therapeutic. It does create great memories, that's the way I feel it. It gives you a sense of control of your life and, uh, and bread can be quite challenging. And if you overcome that challenge, I think there is a feel good you know, attitude, you know, I made it, look at it. There's a sense of empowerment with baking and making your own food, especially a staple like bread. To be able to make that at home, it gives people a sense of calm and comfort. A few simple ingredients, but also a way to adapt, create and overcome. Greg Rasmussen, CBC News, Vancouver. Hey, happy baking, everyone. Full disclosure, I got two jars of yeast for my birthday. Felt like a gazillionaire. Still ahead on The National, a work from home hazard. Even when you have no commute, cool. why well, you should probably you. wear pants. The cautionary tale is our moment. With COVID-19 now for forcing so many people to work from home, it is maybe not surprising that once in a while, some of us get the office rules mixed up with the home alone rules. So consider the following entry to the pantheon of work from home fails, an enthusiastic ABC reporter's short appearance on Good Morning America triggers our moment. Just yet, but the companies do say they will scale up the program if it is successful, guys. So it's not that Will Reeve isn't wearing a professional outfit, it's that he's wearing half of one. Yeah, he forgot his pants cool on national well, television. You. I mean, I'm sure the boxers are comfy and everything. This unsurprisingly triggered a Twitter pile on. But Reeve has embraced his screw up with good humor and he's even taking clothing tips. Of course, he is not the only one to struggle with this whole work from home thing. There's the woman whose cat took over her Zoom meeting. There's the boss who thumbed her nose at her own authority. And there's the influencer who forgot the golden rule of influencing, don't work from your parents' house. What did you do, Mom? Dad, holy crap! To be fair, he does live there. 
So I've been thinking about this today, especially in light of the House of Commons virtual parliament, mm. because the Welsh parliament had a bit of an issue with someone forgetting about muting and a potty mouth minister completely yeah. went off and uh, it changed. I was scared today watching ours. Well, I gotta say, and that, and that is sort of my worst nightmare. Every time we're on a group call, I compulsively check to make sure that I'm still muted lest someone hear me like chomping away on my, uh, my breakfast. That would be uh, embarrassing. I, <laughs> I really did think you were gonna say, check, see if I'm still wearing pants. But I, it's, it's the mute, I get it. It's okay, <laughs> pants still on. That's the National for this Tuesday, okay. April 28th. <laughs> Good night.